Um, okay, well, this is absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, I get going then. And so for the next 50 minutes or so, I will attempt to answer your questions on, um, on the basics of um, writing a novel. And this week we're going to go, we're going to focus on plot. Now, before I start, a couple of disclaimers. I have no formal training in this. I have not done a creative writing course. Um, I haven't a degree in English. I have never learned how to kind of deconstruct novels and, and see how they work. Um, anything that I know, I have learned on the job. Um, and so some of you have sent questions using terms that I think have come from creative writing courses. I'm really sorry, I'm not familiar with them, but I think I get the, um, the gist of, of what you're trying to say. So anyway, life is really hard at the moment. And one of the things that I find absolutely um, lovely is when what I'm writing is going really well and, uh, and I can just escape from reality into it. And it's not always like that, but, um, but for the moment, you're just going to focus on the lovely bits of writing a novel. Um, so the first starting point is different for everybody. Like remember, you are unique and the story you are telling is unique to you. And whatever you want to write about, it's because you have something to say. You know, there's something that you want to put out into the world. Um, and that is different for everybody. But right from the beginning, if you could pretend that the only person you are telling your story for is yourself. Forget about your mother. Forget about the bitches you were at school with. Forget about the people you work with. Forget about newspaper critics. Forget about them all. Write the book that you want to write for yourself. Don't mind about rules. Um, and it can be as sappy or as violent are as bizarre as you want because it's your novel. Um, at some stage, you know, the technicalities will have to come in and, um, and kind of put more of a structure on stuff. But for the moment, that's what you're going to do. Um, so I'm going to start with your questions. And a lot of the questions kind of came in categories. Um, so we'll focus on the various categories. So Okay, somebody called Claire Cook asks, if you could sum up in one sentence a best ever tip for novice novel writers, what would it be? Okay, you're going to hate me because it's very practical advice. Sit down and write it. Your novel will not get written if you don't write it. I think there's this perception that like novels are magical things and they exist in sort of holes in the little rooms in the universe and they're all you need to do is kind of set up the connection from your head to the little room and the connection will come, the story will come through the connection into your head and out through your fingers and basically you're just transcribing it. Um, that's not the case at all. Novels are written from you. They're written from your subconscious. They're written from everything you've learned about human beings, about relationships, about feelings, about dynamics, about events. Um, that's, you know, that's really important, I think, for, for anyone to know that novel writing is probably more mundane than, than maybe you thought. I mean, I really did. Um, before I started writing, I used to read an awful lot, but I used to think that, you know, a writer sat down at their typewriter and they typed the beginning of the story and, and that they knew absolutely everything that was going to happen between the first word and the last word. And they would just keep typing, you know, all through, you know, the doldrums of the middle, um, you know, through the ups and downs. They'd keep going until the kind of the foothills of the ending were in sight. And then they just very confidently keep typing all their way to like a wonderful ending. And it's not like that. Um, so sit down and write it. Um, respect the thing you want to do. Respect it by giving it like time that is exclusively for your novel writing. Like get up half an hour early in the morning or, you know, cut out 45 minutes of Netflix in the evening or, you know, spend less time on Twitter or whatever. But set that time aside and say, this is something I want to do. It's something I've wanted to try. Um, I mightn't be any good at it. I might be utterly fantastic. 
but I am going to give myself that time to find out and do it if you can every day. Um, also, if you can, do it at the same time every day because I found that most interesting creative work comes not from the conscious head but from the subconscious and you can't always that door isn't easy to to, to find a lot of the time um you know what works to get you in one day won't necessarily work the next day but if you're trying to write at the same time every day your subconscious can become sort of trained to um to go uh okay okay i'm here you want me um what you want today um so yeah so try and write every day if you can and um and don't judge what you do especially in the beginning you know at the moment right now what you want to do is you ha you want to have fun and you want your confidence to build um not for somebody to come in and say, ah, for the love of God, you'll never get published with this. Nobody would ever get published with their first attempts. You should see mine. They are like, I'm sweating even thinking of how bad they are. So anyway, so you're going to sit down and you're going to write for half an hour to 45 minutes every day. And the next thing is, a lot of people have asked, um, do I know the entire plot before I begin? And... I don't, but I'm going to tell you about my friend Ella Griffin, who wrote The Flower Arrangement, which is just such a beautiful book, and I would really beg you to read it. Right. She does so much work in advance that not only does she know the whole story, but she actually knows what's going to happen in each chapter. And she has some, would it be Scrivener? She has some fabulous software that has all her chapters. And, you know, and she can fill them in kind of, as she feels it and that's not how I work um, and all I'm saying is there is no wrong way to write a novel um, that like your your choice is is yours um, you know I think a lot of people are sort of hidebound with this feeling that there are rules and that I'm not doing it according to the rules really and truly I hadn't a clue when I started writing I knew nothing I mean, and it's fairly obvious, um, you know, from my earlier books that I had to rashers. But so when I start, I have a character, usually just one, usually a woman. And I have an issue or a situation that is interesting to me. Um, like when I wrote The Break, I, I was interested in a sort of a gruesome way by the thing of like people in long-term relationships taking time out and I was drawn to it and I was also sort of horrified by it but I was interested enough to know that I wanted to write about it but I had no real idea where I was going to go with it um, and over time you know the the character of Amy uh, got fleshed out and the character of Hugh and their situation of their life and but I really didn't know you know a lot happened in that book and uh and I didn't know and that suited me and it may not suit ev I mean obviously it doesn't suit everybody it, do it wouldn't suit Ella Griffin for example um but you find your own way and I mean especially at the beginning if you have just vague ideas of where stuff is going. You don't have to write in a linear way. You don't have to write chronologically. You know, you can write what you think might be your first chapter. And then you might think, I'm not really sure now where to go, but I'm going to write my fifth chapter. I know that something happens in two weeks time um, down the line. Uh, and you can also say, I know something happened to her in her past that was in, in some way it's going to be meaningful in the novel, in this novel that I'm writing. I'm not exactly sure yet, but everything you write gives you information. Um, like, and you really, you don't have to start slotting it all in immediately. Like your plot can be written in, 
I don't know, chunks, chunks of material, if, um, if that makes any sense. And then much later, like you will try and knit it all together in, um, in a, you know, a coherent storyline. And there would be some things that you find you don't even need anymore. Like I jettison a lot of stuff, um, which is kind of excruciating. Like, you know, I mean, and I cod myself, like anytime I uh, delete a chapter or some stuff, I move it into a file called slush or sometimes I call it ideas. And I always say to myself, yeah, well, look at now, I'll be back for that at some stage. I mean, that's going to come in very hard. I mean, that's good work, you know, and I, I, I'll be using that now for excuse me, maybe later in this book or, or definitely for the next one, but it's not wasted, but it's completely wasted, except it's not because it's either given me information about who my characters are or who they aren't. Um, now, I'm going to start looking at some of your questions, if you bear with me and I will. Um, OK, right. Yeah. How do, how to get started? Carmen Glanny Gallagher asks, do you have to know the whole plot before you start or you just blast ahead? Just blast ahead. Although, if you would prefer the safety of, of plotting, then plot. Um, how do you make a story or a plot extend over a couple of hundred pages? You know, that's up to you. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have sent similar questions that they might get six chapters in and suddenly be bored with their character and they don't want to write anymore. And can I try and explain to you what's, what's happened there? Like, whenever I start a book... I get maybe 5,000 words in and like, and it is like being in love. It's like, oh my God, it's working. I've got a character. There's words on the screen and they're coherent sentences. And it's, you know, it's just kind of rosy and glorious. And, and then suddenly bash, like I hit a brick wall and that brick wall is where I suddenly realize that my character is paper thin. Um, and that my plot is ridiculous and that there's nobody in it that I believe in or like. And all this means is that now it's time to start the work. Um, and so for any of you, you know, you've said that you kind of abandon it after, you know, six chapters or, you know, and then you start something new. This comes back to that thing that I said earlier that nobody likes to be told. It's work. Novel writing is work, you know, it's not something that happens magically. It only happens if you write it and you will only write it if you put the work in. And I, people hate me when I tell them that. Um, and I'm sorry. And, and I sound really school marmy and smug. Um, and I don't mean to be because if you do put the work in, it's the most wonderful thing. You go from having this kind of cliched, paper thin, fairly contemptible every woman or, you know, whoever your characters are. And you go deeper and you find out things about them. And there are things suddenly that I've learned I admire about my character or I find out something bold she did or they did. And I think that's cool. You know, you are far more nuanced than I realized in the beginning. You're far more complex. Um, so if that's of any help, you know, when you hit that, that stopping point, it's just that like, you can't sustain a novel by skating along the surface indefinitely. You know, at some point, the forward propulsion has to stop and you have to drop down, go deeper and often, I have to go back and that applies kind of across the board when like for me writing a novel is very stop starty you know I'll get you know there'll be sometimes a leap forward and, and things are going great and then another wall is hit and there are times when I stand and I'm looking kind of at a, a you know blank wall because I don't know where my character's are next to go and instead of trying to keep going forward I have to go back something is wrong in what I've already written you know something something is missing or something doesn't make sense um, in in either the plot or the people or the dynamics um, 
So sometimes, sometimes you can't go forward because you need to go back or you need to go down. Um, and then once you've done that, you go forward again with like a much richer book and with characters that actually you like and you know and uh, and that you're proud of. I mean, there is something about, you know, it's very frustrating, like when you're stuck, you know, and I'm often stuck. But when you put the work in and you can see that your book and characters have become better, then you're glad. And then, you know, then you've learned skills and you've learned not to be afraid the next time. Although I always forget, you know, anytime I hit the wall, um, I'm like, in fairness, like, uh, this is right. I have to start again, you know. Um, yeah, like it's, you know, and another thing, people have asked things like, how do you know when it's right? Like, you don't. Like, this is not a science. You know, writing a novel is not a mathematical formula. And very often you and I have to make decisions about where do I go in my plot? And once you make that decision, you're saying goodbye to other storylines. And I'm often wondering, how, how do I know whether it's right or not? And the thing is, I don't. And that's the challenge, I suppose, living with the uncertainty and kind of trying to, trying to trust, trying to trust your own uh, um, decision making powers. And then also realizing, actually, there is no right feckin' answer here, you know, that there are several possible answers and I have to choose one and and I will never know if it was the best one um if that I don't know if that's of any help um I mean it's like an awful lot of life you know nobody is going to kind of jump out from behind a barrier and say ha ha well I can tell you all the wrong things you did in life, your life and all the wrong decisions. You would have had a much happier life if you hadn't got on that bus in 1963 or whatever. You know, the thing is, if it works, and it will work, because you know if it won't, you know, it could have been maybe better, it might have been a lot worse. But if it works, then it'll have to do. Um, so there's a lot of kind of living with uncertainty or, you know, as a writer, as a novelist, your challenge is to live with never really knowing which is why it's nice to have people that you can trust um to give you feedback i'm going to come to that now right um a lot of people asked you know who do you show your work to and at what stage i would be very careful um especially at the beginning you know i think there's something really lovely about when somebody when you've started to write a novel and and you have written things and you like them and it's thrilling and kind of things are coming together and if you show it to somebody and they pour scorn on it or they're a bit kind of huh, yeah well yeah good yeah if they're like that your fledgling confidence is so crushable i mean i'm, I'm thinking of how i am especially at the beginning like in the beginning, I, I show my work to himself because he is kind and, uh, but not a complete gobshite. Do you know what I mean? Like, like he won't, he won't flim flam me completely. But like, sometimes I'll say to him, all I need now is encouragement, you know, and that's all he'll give me, you know, and he'll, he'll kind of hold back on the, I don't know now about your woman here. What's she at with that? You know, like. Sometimes all you need somebody to say is the writing's lively, I'm interested. Yeah, what I like to be told is I'm interested to know where it goes. Um, so be careful who you show it to. Kind of know in advance what you want from showing your work to somebody. Because if you're looking for constructive feedback, if you get critical feedback, are you able? If all you're looking for is praise, if you're like me, um, and they give you constructive feedback that can also be very crushing and I know this kind of sounds odd but people can be threatened or feel I don't uncomfortable if somebody suddenly starts writing creatively I think that they think um 
I don't know, they, they feel, oh my God, I'm, I don't know them anymore. Or they're going to be writing about me. Or I think you have to really trust a person before you can show them your work. And then, I mean, have any of you ever been in a writer's group? Like I've been in one several times and it is so nice. Um, uh, like we were all writing novels and we were all at various stages and we'd write for a bit in each session and then everybody would read and I mean I would always read my best bit I mean I think we all did and then we'd praise each other and we'd say what was good about each other and and then there were times when you know somebody was like genuinely grappling with characterization or plot or whatever and they would bring it to the group and and we would give it serious consideration, but nobody would be kind of gratuitously unkind at, at, the, at the best of times. Nobody would be gratuitously unkind, but people would only really be uh, kind of go in with the, uh, the scalpel if it was asked for. So if you could find, I mean, I suppose it, now, like with Zoom, you know, you can find people anywhere else in the world. You know, if you find people who kind of want to do that sort of thing, you know, it's very helpful to have peers um, and people who are on the same path as you, giving you feedback. I've just noticed one of the questions going back. I'm sorry, because I'm not good at, at reading the screen and talking at the same time. Um, but uh, somebody said, do I write for myself or for others? I completely write for myself. Um, and I don't mean this to be in any way disrespectful. I'm so grateful for the readers that I have. Um, it is such a... I still can't believe it. You know, I can't believe that so many of you have showed up tonight. Um, but the only way that I can kind of serve any reader um, is to pretend that there aren't any. Um, I have to pretend that nobody will read my book ever um, because it gives me freedom to write the uncomfortable stuff, the unpleasant stuff, um, you know, to give my characters aspects that are really not likable um, or to have them do things that are questionable. Um, like even, you know, even when people have been very nice to me uh, about, say, the, the previous book, if I start thinking you know, they like X and Y about the previous book. I think, oh God, well, I better try and bring those aspects to the new book. And it just, it corrupts everything. Um, it means that I'm kind of writing with one eye on the shoulds, you know. Um, it just interferes. So honestly, I would tell everyone, um, like, don't... Don't write for anyone except yourself. Ask yourself, is this the book I'd like to read? You know, would I be entertained if I picked this up? Would I be interested? Now, here's himself. He's going to tell me something. Oh, he's brought me a, a list of questions. Um, God, there are thousands. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Um, do I use a particular word processor while you write? Ulysses, a writer, Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word. Um, what I do is I, I write a... Um, a file and when it gets to about 20,000 I call it file one and when it gets to 20,000 words I start a second file and I call it file two and then after uh, the 20,000 words have passed I start another one called you'll never guess file 16 that's right yeah I mean that's how it works for me but like other people have very fancy stuff and um and uh you know they do the chapters and everything while I'm at it, a lot of people have asked um, about word count, like how, how long should a book be? You know, I think it can be anywhere really between, I think, about 55,000 words. And and I mean, I think my last book was about 160,000 words. I just, I really wish I didn't write such long books. Each book I write, I really try for them to be shorter. Um, and it just seems to be the way it is. I mean, I wish... I wish that they were shorter, but like, this is who I am and these are the books I write. Um, so 55,000 would be kind of on the, the short end. And, 
you know, it, you would be more likely to, um, uh, if it was an, a literary novel, shorter, 55,000 words would be good. I mean, I think, I don't know, 70, 80,000 words seems to be kind of the, the sweet spot. But again, if, you're, if your story is longer or shorter, let it be. You know, write it first and then you can do the fiddling around afterwards if needs be. Um, well, thank you. Somebody said they don't wish for them to be shorter. Thank you. Yeah, I'm afraid because that's the only way I can do it. Uh, okay, somebody says here, Declan456, is it better to start by trying to write a short story? I mean, you could in that it would give you a sense of your voice. Um, it would give you a, oh, how would you call it? Yeah, it would connect you with with writing. But short stories are hugely different artistic endeavours than novels are. Um, I mean, I can't write short stories. They're gems. They're absolute art forms. Um, I, I like meandery space. But certainly try with the short story. Um, I mean, I tried. I started with short stories and they weren't really. I mean, they were they were insane, you know. But they were really helpful in that, like, it gave me, they gave me confidence. And I did have an idea very quickly of, you know, the kind of thing I wanted to write from them. And, um, and I, you know, I only kind of wrote, started writing a novel because I lied and said I had already started. But then it was duck to water stuff. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I know now I cannot write short stories. Um... Ashling Nikiarnig asks, do I follow three act structure? I don't know what that is. I'm really sorry. I have heard that films are written in three act structures, but I don't. And sometimes it saddens me when I hear people ask about things like that, because I think, I, I think it kind of puts constraints on people that's not necessary. You know, somebody else asks, you know, what's, what's the percentage between dialogue and prose, I have no idea. Um, does it matter? Um, you know, you'll know if you've too much dialogue in it. Um, or, or would you? You know, there are some novels that are all dialogue. Um, I really would try, uh, if it's helpful, if it's helpful, you know, with, with th those structures, go for it. But if they're making you nervous, like, feck them, like, abandon them. Like, you're not going to be arrested, you know, for uh, putting 27% dialogue in it instead of 25%. Uh, like, you're meant to be having fun and you're meant to be being true to what you want to create instead of there with your, your calculator and adding the words in each, in each spoken sentences. Um... Right then. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Akeen99 says, does anyone ever find it difficult not to be influenced by books you have read? Oh, God, yeah. Like, uh, there are times I have to stop reading when I'm writing because, you know, if I'm reading something very kind of arch and proper, I start writing elegant sentences. I don't because obviously I couldn't, you know, because it's not in my DNA. But I, I get a little bit kind of constrained and, and, and tight. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think... Also, I think if you if there's somebody you really love, like a writer you really love, um, it's hard not to want to be like them, um, you know, to give it a go. Um, no, hold on. Marion, how important are character names? I sometimes spend ages trying to think of the right name for a character. Does it matter? To me, it matters enormously. Um, and, you know, you have to be really careful about things like having lots of characters whose names begin with the same letter. I know that this sounds really pathetic, but at the end of the day, if you're thinking about somebody having an easy reading experience, every character has to, their name has to kind of encapsulate their entire character. Um, so, I mean, I try and mix it up with like, you know, some Irish names, 
you know, European names, um, names that begin with vowels, names like, you know, like Mary Rose with the dash in the middle. So the minute, like, so if somebody is reading quickly and they, you know, and their, their eye flashes on Mary Rose, I think, oh yeah, go round, I know who she is, you know, and then they're on to Oshin, right? Oshin, yeah, the Irish one begins with O. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I spent hours fiddling with them, um, with the names. Um, I mean, I actually have probably at least three, most days I Google things like, Arabic women's names because I'm looking for you know something kind of pretty that makes their name stand out uh, so yes I would uh I would I spend way too much time probably on characters names um right then oh yeah yeah okay research and um how how much should you do right everybody's first novel they say is the most autobiographical of all their novels um not the case for everybody but I think it, it, it seems to be the case for a lot of people you know and Maeve Binchy said write what you know um the thing is you don't have to write what you know but if you don't know it you have to be prepared to research it and again that's entirely up to you how much you do but like if you're writing a novel set in 16th century Holland you're going to have to research it um however not everything that you learn has to be put in the book. You know, you don't have to kind of drop, you know, the Wikipedia, uh, you know, of um, the, the merchants in um, the trade in 16th century Holland. Um, you know, your reader isn't there for that. You have to metabolize your material, if you know what I mean. Um, and very often, if you do the research, and you feel you researched it well enough, you actually need to put very little into, into the novel of the research. You know, it, they can be, the, the pieces of information that you get to create time and place can be side, how would you call them? They needn't be the full focus of every attention, every sentence. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky one, but again, this is something that I haven't kind of stressed enough. With any book, you do so much rewriting. Like, well, I do. Um, like, I rewrite sentences. I rewrite paragraphs and chapters. Also, I move them around. Like, it's like, in a way, having, um, you know, solving a Rubik's Cube. Like, having lots and lots and lots of chapters. And... Uh, Especially like if you have um, a novel with a lot of uh, characters, you know, that you, I have to keep moving them. And like if I move one closer to the, to the start of the novel, it impacts on, on how, you know, how much information is doled out through the rest of the novel. Um, and a lot of people have asked about like, do you start with something, um, you know, should a, should a novel start with like a big event? Like it doesn't have to. I mean, you can use an, a prologue that can hint at something big coming at some stage in the novel. And then you can you can take your time then kind of working up to it. But like every novel is about some sort of change. Either like somebody is, somebody gets killed or somebody loses their job or something happens you know and it can be small and it can be enormous you know a war starts uh you know the archduke ferdinand gets assassinated it can be anything but like something has to happen to change the order of life in the novel previously um there can be no story without without something bad happening. I, I'm sorry, you know, um, there is no, nothing more boring than hearing about somebody's happy life, you know? Like, uh, you can listen to it for so long about their, their excellent children, and their wonderful children, their gifted children, their fabulous job where they get paid tons and they have to do feck all, you know? And you're delighted for them for a little while. And then you think, Aaron now, you know, 
You think, hold on, I need a bit of texture here. Come on, give me a flat tire. Give me something small I can work with. You know, definitely you need, there needs to be an unpleasant event of some sort at some stage in the book. Earlier rather than later, I would have said. Um, that's just me, of course. No, it isn't just me. It isn't just me. Um, also, uh, you need to balance, right? So you'll have your drama fairly early on, you know, to get, I should also say, like, I hope it's clear that I'm talking about commercial novels here. I'm talking about commercial writing. I, you know, if you want to talk about um, literary novels, you probably don't have, or, you know, if you're going to play around with structure or language or whatever, you probably don't need any of this information, you know, and you're probably laughing at me and uh, going, <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. That's fine. But, but for, for, for a commercial novel, you know, you have to keep people interested, especially yourself. Um, so drama and then, and then there's kind of the, the calmer, the calmer chapter, you know, where then you start giving information about who your people are, what's going on here, what the wider picture is. Um, and then, then, then there'll be a bit more drama. Um, and you know, that the, the second wave of drama is in response to the first one. And, you know, people were asking me about, I don't know, hitting something or others. I'm sorry for not knowing, but you do think, um, okay. And there needs to be a pattern. There does need to be a pattern. Um, I hope this makes sense. You know, there need to be waves in a novel, like there needs to be drama. And then there needs to be kind of a quieter time where like you're giving yourself and your reader interesting stuff. And then, you know, you move on to the drama again. And then at some stage, you will have to probably give some backstory. And a lot of you have asked that as well. Like, at what stage do you do it? Um, not too soon. You know, you've got to establish everything fairly solidly. You know, your drama and also your, your status quo or the status quo as it was before the drama. And only then do you start kind of introducing past stuff. Um, but you don't have to know exactly when because chapters are there to be moved around. Do you know, like, uh, write it anyway, and if you've gone too soon, you can just move it back further into the novel. Um, now, I'm going to talk to you about Pov's point of views. Took me a long time to know what that was. Okay, our voices, right? First person is simply when you write the I. Um, uh, you know, I did this or I woke up and my ceiling fell in on my head. And that wasn't even the second worst thing that happened to me that day. You know, it's I, you know, you are talking directly to the reader. And that has a lot of charm. And I mean, I like it because it's it's conversational. It's intimate. You know, you're talking directly to your reader and. Um, and, you know, you're able to tell everything in your head. Um, the only, I mean, there are limitations on that then. It's like, there is only one point of view really in the whole novel, you know, like, um, you can't, you can't know how people you encounter in the novel. You can't know how they're thinking. Um, I mean, you can go about getting information in other ways. Like you can get it from information from, you know, dialogue. Um, but it has its limits. Now, um, then there is second person. Um, uh, it's not commonly used, but basically it's when somebody is writing a novel to another person. They're saying, you know, you would have understood if you had been there, how I behaved that particular day. Um, you were always the one to understand. Do you know, like, it's a tricky one. I mean, very often it's, you know, what's the word? epistolatory, I think, yeah, it's letters, you know, when people are writing letters to people, um, it, it's one I wouldn't be gone on myself, but look at, 
each to their own. Um, then there is third person and there's kind of two ways to do that. Um, one is kind of the omniscient third person where it's like you're God, you know, you see all your characters, um, you see all the world that they live in and you can say things like meanwhile across town blah blah was blah 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 at the same time in such a place you know you're able to kind of you know move people around like things on a chessboard um then so that's the omniscient third person but then there is also third persons where like you have lots of characters but you're almost for first personing each character like you are inside their head and you're hold on he's here with more questions thank you thank you thanks yeah so you're inside their head and you're kind of seeing the world from their point of view only and those characters will only know about their point of view if you know what i mean um, so yeah, so you'll have two characters, or you know, have lots, say you'll have 20 characters and you know what's going on in everybody's head, but like each of them only knows what's going on for them. So it's interesting. However, in any novel, oh yeah, Pav means point of view. Yes, 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 yes. Um, limited third person. Thank you. Thank you. I'm learning things. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, yeah. And, uh, so then, um, you can have first person and third person in the same book. Um, and I kind of, I've noticed that a lot, maybe in the last, I don't know, seven or eight years, that people are having more fun with, with voices in novels. You know, that like you have one person and they're spilling their guts to you, like they're in first person. And then you have another character in the book and their story has been written in a third person way. And like both the characters can interact but they experience each other differently, do you know? Um, it's basically first person with third person pronouns, exactly. That's when you're third person, third person, first person. Yeah, so you can do it anyway, so long as it's, there's a word I'm looking for, coherent, you know? You can't suddenly have your first person become, first person voice becoming third person or second person, or you can't have a third person, first person suddenly become omniscient third person. Um, the other side of the story, thank you so much. Yes. Um, okay, I've just seen a question going past. How, ma how many characters should there be? That's entirely up to you. Um, the thing is, everyone is different. I have 4,000 characters and, and other people have three characters. However, even with me, I, you know, I've just had to cut a character. You know, I just had too many. It was making things messier than it needed to be. Like, this is the thing that needs to be kind of said again and again and again. Like, everything changes and changes and changes and changes. Like, it's constant fiddling and it's constant work. It's constant moving. So, yeah, so I've taken a character out in the last couple of days and... I'll see now how it settles with the ones I have left, but I might have to take more out. And you know, it is very painful because he was a lovely fella. Like, you know, I really liked him and he did, he had some lovely dialogue, but he didn't really fulfill a function that another, that, you know, that the other characters weren't already doing. Um, so you will decide. Um, and, if you like having lots of characters, have lots of characters, but do understand that at some stage your plot can get crowded and you can't sort of, it's not really on to create a character and then abandon them. You know, they have to, they have to kind of remain like a thread through. You know, you can't, yes, I do grieve lost characters. Somebody just, died. I feckin' do, you know, I do. Um, and uh, so, hold on now. Yeah, so if you can't, if you can't give each character, even the small ones, their own special light, let them go, you know? And if they're not fulfilling a genuine function, let them go. It's very hard, 
It's very hard, you know? And then you might get further along and you think, oh, feck. I feckin' did actually feckin' need them. And, you know, so it goes. You, you, what's the word? We, you bring them back to life. Um, now, hold on, so I keep looking at my questions. What about having two first person's point of view? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. But you have to be very sure to d distinguish them. Um, if you're having two or more different first person point of views, their voices have to be different. Um, you, you know, because a first person storyline is so intimate and they have to resurrect thank you very much thank you yes resurrect thank you resuscitate thank you revive thank you god you're all great yeah jesus and me meant to be meant to be a writer um it's the uh menopause menopause brain um yeah if you have more than one first person give them different voices like internalize the character properly um you know there's nothing more kind of weird or discomforting uh to read a book with several first persons and their voices are identical. Um, the Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver is the most wonderful um, example of four different first person point of views. It is just, it's glorious. Uh, read it uh, if you haven't already. Um, what about contrasting character points of view? i.e. alternate alternating between points of view do you mean telling the same the same facts um from two different points of view i mean it's absolutely uh i i'm just reading a book at the moment where where it's being done and uh so long as both points of view both versions of the same event are actually actually uh, giving fresh information to the reader so long as that's the case then work away like it, it's absolutely grand um you know don't do it just for artistic uh enjoyment you know like anything like that that's done like anything that's really done ultimately has to serve the story now a lot of people have asked about putting real people in books i'm going to see if i can find a a, a couple of the questions uh okay do you think you should draw on your own experiences right about what you know and if so do it in the first place person i mean it's entirely up to anyone to draw on their own experiences um and i have found like i mean you know i wrote about rehab and rachel's holiday and i had been to rehab um i don't think it's a good idea although it doesn't matter i mean i think if you try and fictionalize Sorry, I've, himself is just flashing me a sign that says 50 minutes. I will finish up fairly soon. Um, got this flu, lads. Um, okay, you, sh you don't should have to do anything. You know, you don't have to draw on your own experience. But if you want to, realise that things that happen in real life don't always happen in the same neat way that stories do in fiction. Like stories and fiction are tidied up versions of the messy way our lives play out. Um, so if you are using things from your own life, you're going to have to repackage it um, to make it more readable. Also, and I think this is sort of lovely, if you start with something real, either about yourself or, you know, that happened to somebody you know, um, sooner or later, if you keep at it, it changes. It moves away from the original the original um, event, the real life event, and it, 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 it changes, it becomes its own thing. And, and then you're sort of free from reality. Now about including real people, I think if you're a writer, you're constantly kind of taking notes. Everybody you meet is interesting in some way, um, good or bad. And it'll go somewhere into your subconscious. But the idea of putting an actual real person into a novel seems to me, I think everybody would agree, would be a very mean thing to do. Um, if you feel, if you feel you have to, try it 
And then hopefully that thing that I said about the real life becoming fiction, hopefully that it will become not real very quickly. Um, or maybe some some remnants of the truth will remain, um, but without the actual person in it. Um, I think, you know, novelists have responsibilities and I, I would uh, I would um, really um, bear that in mind. Uh, I'm sorry, now this absolutely rattled by. Uh, um, mm -mm -mm. How do I manage a large document? Any special software? No, w word, word. Um, but like you don't you don't even need a computer. Like you can you can write with a Pian Louis and a pen or a, a you know. You don't have to have uh, you don't have to have things technology, although it's handy for saving things. Um, so look at I think we're coming up to an hour now. Um, next week is going to be on characterization. However, I did say that we are going to have. Thank you, whoever said good girl Marion there. We are going to I'm going to give you um, a daily challenge every day for the next week. Every day for the next week, you are going to write. 500 words. I am going to post a sentence on Instagram and Twitter every morning and you will use that to write your 500 words. Please do not overthink it. Write quickly. What this is for you is an exercise in getting in touch with your subconscious. Just and also to see what sort of genre you're drawn to and what sort of what dynamics interest you. So Please try and do that for yourself. It's 500 words. It's really not that much. Um, and, uh, and we'll meet back here next Monday at half past seven and we will talk about characterization. Thank you so much for coming. It was such fun. I hope it was helpful in some way. But you know what? If this is something you want to do, do it. Why not? You know, there are no gatekeepers. Do what you like. Have fun with it. Do your writing exercises. See what it tells you. And um, see you. Have a good week. Stay safe. Wear your mask. Isolate. All of them things. Thank you.